This is Bill Valerio, and I am recording the first part of a presentation that Woodmere organized on the evening of June 12th. This was a presentation to the community, an open house in which we described the current state of our work um, renovating McGuire Hall. And um, the reason I'm re-recording this is because although we recorded the community meeting, I was far enough away from the microphone when I was speaking that my voice wasn't recorded. Francis M. McGuire Hall was actually built as a residence in the mid-1850s for the Trotter family. This was a mercantile family who lived in downtown Philadelphia, and they built the core of the house as a summer retreat. It changed hands, and in the 1890s, it was substantially enlarged by the family of Alfred Craven Harrison, who hired the architects Cope and Stewartson, and the way we see the building today is largely a result of Cope and Stewartson's work on the house. They built two large additions onto the central Victorian core of the building and reorganized the interior space of the Victorian core. In the 1920s, it was repurposed as a convent, as a residence for the Sisters of St. Joseph. And in 2021, with an outpouring of extraordinary community support and with a lead gift from the McGuire Foundation, Woodmere purchased the estate and um, it is now called Francis M. McGuire Hall. The first question I'm usually asked is, how much money have we raised? A $28.5 million budget, we've raised 21 million, and we perceive ourselves to be in the, you know, what we would call the closing phase of the campaign. The reason I'm so excited about Francis M. McGuire Hall has to do with an absolute and clear transformation of Woodmere's impact, and it starts with the collection. So Woodmere's collection has many strengths, Philadelphia modernism, realism as it evolved in 20th century Philadelphia, contemporary art in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania impressionism, and impressionism as it evolved in Philadelphia. These are powerful aspects of our collection, all of which will have their own dedicated galleries. And I believe that changes our ability to serve our community. It changes the ability for teachers to work with the collection, knowing that works of art are on long-term view. We will build special galleries for distinct masterpieces inside the collection. And so here, for example, the Russell Harris Gallery for Violet Oakley's House of Wisdom um, will have a uh, its own purpose-built gallery that shows off the murals the way Violet imagined them being experienced. Um, in terms of the rest of the galleries, we're doing a big cleanup of many parlors and bedrooms, and um, I'm showing you a rendering from our architects of what one such um, gallery may look like. Um, this is a gallery that will be devoted to modernism as it evolved in Philadelphia. Um, and although our architects tend to show restraint in their renderings, our intention is to hang the collection, in most cases, in a salon style. Uh, this is how art was experienced through most of the centuries since the Italian Renaissance. And I'm even showing um, a picture of Woodmere in 1910 when it opened its doors to the public. And you can see the big rotunda-shaped gallery that we have hung floor to ceiling and the center of the space full of you know, beautiful, curious um, objects from around the world. And of course, I'm also showing the Barnes Foundation and a somewhat symmetrical hanging of paintings in a salon style. And then what a European salon might have looked like in the 17th century with paintings going all the way up to the ceiling and even tilting forward so you could look up and see them um, above you. <laughs> Using the opportunity of McGuire Hall to expand the collection in a few ways and one of them 
um, has to do with something I've always been interested in, and that is the history of jewelry making in Philadelphia. And we will create three galleries in the basement of the building that we will call our jewelry vault. And um, Philadelphia has a unique history in this art form, going back to the English silversmiths of, of early European Philadelphia and coming right up to today. And I'm showing works by Doug Bucci, who's the head of the silversmithing and jewelry department at Tyler School of Art. That's his digitally printed necklace. And above it, um, the work by the man who was Doug Bucci's teacher, Stanley Lexen. And that is a silver and gold electroplated buckle with a giant amethyst. And um, Lexen, you know, pioneered certain techniques of electroplating with gold, just as Bucci um, in his footsteps has pioneered certain ways of using digital printing technology to make jewelry and it is very much the case and the story that we'll be telling in our jewelry galleries is that you know Philadelphia is a city of practical science and inventiveness going back to you know say Benjamin Franklin and the invention of things like the lightning rod or bifocals. We will also build something that we've always wanted and that is a children's art studio. Uh, we have an adult art studio that many of you will know where classes take place. A children's art studio is a different thing altogether with different equipment requirements and different kind of spaces that are needed. And again, I think this will represent an expansion of Woodmere's ability to serve its community. And that brings me uh, to our grounds, you know, one of the exciting things about what we're able to do at McGuire Hall is preserve this large and uh, beautiful piece of green space. And here um, I'm showing an overview of the grounds. Our landscape architect, Darren Damone from Andrew Pogon, will jump into this in detail. <laughs> but for now, let me say that I'm incredibly excited about the integration of art nature, education, and environmental science across the grounds. We will build several distinct kinds of gardens, such as the dyeing, weaving, and foraging garden that you see here. And you know, this will be a place that's very much a children's garden where we do art, pro where we grow the materials for making art projects. And so, uh, uh, materials for making paper, for weaving baskets, for making dyes that can be used in art making. We are also working with our friends from the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania and we're going to integrate a foraging experience into many of the gardens on the grounds at McGuire Hall. And I'm showing a pawpaw fruit and um, some wild berries we're going to introduce this idea of foraging for sustenance and what that means in terms of a relationship um, to the land. And I'm just showing an example of a sculpture installation that we are planning. We are so fortunate to work with Andrew Pogon, our partners in the landscape, because they have a creativity uh, that's very deep in terms of the placement of sculpture in the landscape. And finally, the last thing I would like to describe is our schedule. Woodmere is on schedule to open McGuire Hall to the public in the spring of 2025. And to date, there's nothing to make me think that we can't do that. So I'm very much looking forward to that. I will now turn the meeting over to Darren Damone from Andrew Pogon. And I have every reason to believe that it will go smoothly from here and that Darren is fully legible. Thank you everyone and um, be well. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Um, so Bill talked a little bit about some of the particular, Does that work? Maybe. Um, Bill's talked a little bit about some of the specific elements of the landscape. I'll get into a little bit more detail. 
So this is just a general site plan. For those of you who are familiar with the project um, and have been part of these community meetings before, not a, a lot has changed with the landscape design in particular. There's been some scaling back of some of the elements in particular around the, the lawn terrace where there was some paving area that we decided more appropriate to actually make that a, a large expanse of lawn. Um, but for the most part, a lot of these elements that you can see the delivery entrance, the meadow, the loading dock, the deck, um, parking court, all those things have sort of remained intact and in the same location and configuration that they were um, before. So um, again, in terms of project goals, all this has sort of remained intact from what our original intent was with the project in terms of the overall planning for the project. We were very much um, in tune with sort of being responsive to our neighbors. In other words, in terms of citing the major elements from a landscape perspective, like the parking, um, making sure that they were actually adjacent to, um, you know, uh, contextually appropriate neighbors like Norwood Fonfon. So the athletic fields that are kind of directly south of the site, we felt it was most appropriate to, to locate the majority of the parking in that particular location, as opposed to on the other side, for example, where you might be closer to more um, residential um, neighbors. And then from a, from a more nuanced perspective, once you make those bigger site moves, um, being sensitive to the way you actually design a parking lot. So rather than creating a sort of a one monolithic bank of parking, making it so it sort of meanders, works with the topography of the site, breaking it up with planting. Um, so being a little bit more thoughtful with the layout of that particular um, design element. And then um, really um, keying in on the character of the site. So this, the, the estate trees in particular, taking a really hard look at what the health and character of those trees are with our friends at Morris Arboretum, and then making decisions from there in terms of um, what can be saved, what needs to be taken down for health and safety reasons and things of that nature. And then, um, as Bill mentioned, being thoughtful about our what we need to do from a site infrastructure perspective. And when I say infrastructure, I really mean stormwater management. So um, trying to manage water as, you know, as closely to where it actually falls on the site. In other words, we want to capture and infiltrate water as close to wherever that raindrop falls on the site as possible. So that's why we use things like forest paving. So the idea is you're not letting that, that, that water hit the ground, hit asphalt paving, heat up, run off and then run into a sort of sewer system and then ultimately end up in the Wissick. And what we want to do is really, you know, take that water, either infiltrate it right there or take it directly adjacent to that pavement into a vegetated swale, which as Bill mentioned, allows it to you know, slow that water down. You allow that water to cool down. You allow that sediments to actually settle out of that water before it infiltrates back into the soil. And then lastly is, is biodiversity. We have this amazing resource right next to us in the Wissick and and we really wanted to draw inspiration from that landscape and you know, infuse this landscape, which is predominantly right now is, is made up of turf and canopy trees and introduce things like meadows, which not only are an amazing benefit to managing water, but they're also an amazing opportunity in terms of injecting biodiversity into the site. So what we've done here is we've developed some views to give you a sense of what the character of this landscape is gonna be as you arrive. So this is, um, arriving as a pedestrian off Germantown Avenue as you approach the front door of the building and you get a sense of, of what the character of the landscape is going to be again transitioning from predominantly turf grass which doesn't have a high value in terms of biodiversity um, and habitat value um, to a, a much more rich and diverse native landscape um, and this you're also sort of starting to get a glimpse of the art garden which we have another view of adjacent to um, so as you approach more closely, this is sort of the confluence of, of pedestrian paths, whether you, um, you enter from the south or from the north coming off Germantown, they both um, basically intersect at this front door on access with the front door of the building. This amazing water feature um, that we're developing here as part of a, a new sculpture piece that we're introducing to the landscape, um, fully universal access to the building. So you can, um, you can see on the left-hand side of the frame here is a new path that will lead you up to the um, the front door and the porch of the building. Um, and this is the, as you would enter off Germantown to the left, this is the art garden or the uh, dyeing and weaving garden that Bill was um, talking about earlier. Again, we're taking advantage of one of the sunnier spots of this site to reintroduce these gardens that can be used as an asset 
and a tool um, for the educational programs here at Woodmere. This is um, going to be closer to if you were to actually walk off this property and walk um, south on Germantown, this is going to be one of the first access points into the Francis M. McGuire campus. Um, we're going to actually penetrate one of the walls that is right now along Germantown Ave and allow you to actually walk in and start to experience that landscape. And you can actually either walk around to the back and meander into the meadow, or you can veer off to the right here and, and sort of ascend up the slope towards the front door of the building itself. And then this is the, to the left here is the lawn terrace, which is meant as sort of an unprogrammed open space for the community to use. Woodmere may use it from time to time for larger events, but the idea is it's very unprogrammed, allowing it you know, to, to maintain, be maintained as, as green open space. And then lastly is the meadow. Um, so this is, as Bill mentioned, the low point in the property. Um, the idea here is, um, you know, transitioning this, what is currently a fairly steep, steep area and allows a lot of water to run off down to the low point of the site and create a lot of issues for some of our neighbors here. Um, what this does is by making this meadow, you're increasing the root depth, you're allowing infiltration to occur um, more slowly. Um, and we think that it'll be a really amazing benefit to the to the property. And with that, I will turn things over to John. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Darren. Thanks to everybody who made it out on the rather challenging evening. I think this is the first rain we've seen in at least five weeks, but boy, do we need it. And uh, Okay, so I'm just going to spend a few minutes going through some of the issues that we've been facing as we develop the architectural drawings for the building. Uh, I think the main thing to bring to everyone's attention, particularly those of you that were have been following this through from the very beginning, is that the initial site and building concept included a restaurant, kitchen, as in an auditorium, and that's now been split up into multiple phases of work. So phase one is going to create the main building galleries, public access throughout the building with the addition of an elevator and where the cafe will be sited in phase two becomes a large open deck for outdoor activities and events. So this is a rendering of the rear showing the elevator being located where it has been shown from day one. It's really the only possible place to put an elevator that can link the various levels of the building together. I've counted about uh, nine different levels in the existing building. So the architects who did the two additions really had no concern for accessibility. They had servants to carry everything up and down all the stairs, but that's not the world we live in today. So uh, an elevator is a really important element in order to provide full accessibility to virtually every, every level in the building. Um, another thing you can notice in this rendering is the porch, which is currently enclosed on two sides. And one of the really vital enhancements we believe to the building is to remove the enclosures on the two porches and open it up so that you will have the original feel of the wraparound porch when the building was built in the 1850s. See how I do here. Okay, All right. So again, just to show you the change that will occur on the rear quadrant of the site, we are doing everything we can to preserve as many of the existing historic features as possible. That includes the second story bay window that you can see. Uh, the fire escape I'll get to in a moment, but you can see the, uh, the deck, which will become the future support for the, for the restaurant. Oops, Let's go this way. Okay, so. Uh, phase two, the schedule is not really worked out yet on when that will occur. It's contingent on 
getting phase one up operating and uh, fundraising potentials, but still the intent of the second phase is to build out the restaurant and cafe above the proposed deck. And then phase three will conclude the campus with this mostly underground auditorium toward Green Tree Avenue. It's intentionally designed to be sunk way down deep into the land to minimize the appearance from the residential neighbors on Hampton and Green Tree with only a corner of the building sticking up above ground to provide access. Okay, I talked, mentioned the porch before. In the upper right, you can see the existing condition, and we think this is just a tremendous improvement to tear down the enclosures and uh, bring that Victorian wraparound porch back, back into being. Uh, another thing that we want to talk about that is relatively new to those of you that have been following along is what we're doing with the existing windows. So there's a challenge in, a, in an art gallery to have as many square feet of wall space as possible, particularly if you're interested in a salon style presentation. Uh, but this building has a lot of windows. And so we're doing our best to balance the desire for hanging space with the desire for natural lighting and views, but it does require closing up several of, of the windows on the building, particularly with the Violet Oakley Gallery, which cannot be built in the configuration that it was originally designed without closing up a lot of the windows. And window closure is something that's happened throughout history as buildings change function. Um, on the left is an example from the Aubrey Arboretum. That's a window, but in fact, it's there's a solid wall behind it. So we're using a combination of filling in certain op window openings with windows, like what you see in that Arbor Arboretum photograph, and other windows will be filled in with a st stone veneer. So this is the, the rear and the black frames indicate windows that will be filled in, but with the matching Wissahickon disc. This is the front of the building. This is the most important, the, the face of the building to the public. And on the right-hand side in blue, you can see these are locations where we will have the actual glass windows in front of a solid wall. and that's primarily because on the second story, on the right-hand side will be the Violet Oakley room. And this is an artist's rendering of what, you know, what those built-in windows will look like. So, so our intention here is to maintain the rhythm and spacing of the existing front of the building. And we recognize that Filling these in with stone was really not the right, not the right thing to do. But as we move around to the back, you know, we less prominent, we think the stone will be a, a good choice there. And if anyone has questions about the, the window infill, Justin Detweiler has graciously volunteered his time to, to come to yet another Woodmere meeting. Um, okay, I'm going to talk briefly about life safety issues. So like the, the amount of windows that are open versus filled in, we're also trying to balance life safety concerns with an historic building. There's, there's lots of amazing woodwork throughout the first floor and the stairwell. The staircase is open from the first floor to the third floor. And there are examples like that that are not the way someone would build a building today that is being used as a museum. It's, it's okay in a, in a single family residence, it's grandfathered in as a convent, but these open stairwells and some of the historic woodwork are just not acceptable under today's building codes. So while many of you are familiar with all the zoning code variances that we went through last year, 
we're now in the process of going through building code variances with licenses and inspections. And our goal is to preserve as much of the character defining features of the building interior as L and I will allow us to do. Uh, and we had a hearing a couple of weeks ago and we're waiting on the final determination from L and I as to what they will accept, but they were, they were generally in agreement with, with our positions in terms of historic preservation. Um, but at the same time, understanding that it's a building that's gonna have dozens and dozens of people in it and they need a safe way out of the building. One of the areas in particular that we're working on is the main staircase. The city doesn't want it to be open all the way from the first floor to the third. And uh, so we're introducing a sprinkler system throughout the entire building. That helps a great deal in terms of uh, what L and I building codes allow. Uh, they wanted to close off the stair at the second floor ceiling, but they've agreed to allow us to keep it open with the introduction of these glass panels called smoke baffles that will ring the upper portions of the staircase. Exactly how this is gonna be resolved is still in flux, but it's an example where the city seems to be willing to work with us um, to preserve you know, the really important historic features of the building. Another issue was the elevator and the fire stair. In order to make the elevator the code required size. If we would have had to encroach upon that bay window that you can see on the second floor, but they've agreed to allow us to keep a slightly smaller elevator so that we don't have to chop into the, the bay window. And the fire escape is another example where um, current building codes really don't like to see fire escapes. So if we followed the letter of the code, we'd be building a fully enclosed fire stair, stair tower going up three floors. And that would have been incredibly detrimental to the character of the, the building. So they allowed us to have a fire escape. We're replacing the fire escape that's there with one that is a little more code compliant. Ellen, I also wanted us to have a, a door out the third floor where that little round arch window is. And that would have required completely rebuilding the roof and all those brackets and gables, but they've again allowed some leeway there. And we are going to turn that window into a, into a door, but retain the arch. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what your architectural team, including Matthew Baird in New York has been uh, working on over the last few months. And I think this is a great time to open the floor for questions. Uh, Justin, I'm looking at your general direction, but I can uh, I can take a swing at this. I think my as far as I'm right that. That's our assumption was that that was installed when the when the building was converted to a convent because there were quite a number of nuns living on the third floor. Thank you. 
How about, well, no, but we're talking about the Zoom audience, I think is, so maybe if I use this microphone and this microphone, the question was about a space in the building that in its years as a residence for the Sisters of St. Joseph was used as a chapel. It's a very beautiful space with wood paneling designed by um, a woodworker named Edward Main, who was a an immigrant from Belgium who became the A-level woodworker for your, you know, important house. Huh. Yeah. So um, why don't we pass that around? That's a picture of the space. It was originally built as the dining room of the house. It was built in the 1890s by Cope and Stewardson, the architects, the woodwork um, was by Edward Vane. And we're going to keep that as a place to do exactly this, to have lectures, um, to have special events and so forth. And the space will open out onto that beautiful large deck that you've been seeing. But, you know, we're going to preserve that space. It's one of the beautiful spaces um, in, in the building. So thank you for, thank you for mentioning it. And I think there was a question over there. The question was about uh, the deck and the space underneath the deck. So the deck is an outdoor entertaining space. Underneath it will be an, the loading dock to access the elevator. So artwork that is being moved in and out of the building will come in underneath that deck to access the elevator that runs from the basement level all the way up to the top floor. Well, and I, I, I'll just add that from an operational point of view, at a museum, the loading dock is where the mailman comes. It's, you know, the FedEx truck. Um, it's the trash pickup. I mean, all those things happen in the loading dock. So, you know, it'll be a beautiful deck up above, um, but hidden below will be, you know, a, um, you know a, a, basically a utility space, but the loading dock for things to go in and out. So I wonder if this is a good opportunity to introduce Megan Madeira from Aegis. Um, Aegis um, is our, our, our owner's rep. And, and Megan is the person who's gonna be cracking the whip on the schedule. I wonder, Megan, if you wanna come up and talk everyone through you know, what these different phases are and um, you know, what the expectations might be. So right now we're focused only on phase one because that is the one that we have the funding for completely. Um, and we are finishing up our design right now. We're in what's called construction documents. So taking drawings that are conceptual and putting the details together for the builder to actually be able to build it. And we'll finish that this fall uh, to then bid out and then start construction, I'd say roughly uh, October, November of this year. So we're looking right in that fourth quarter of this year. Construction will go all through 2024, and then we need a little bit of a cure period once construction's done, dust to settle, make sure the systems are all functioning, to then allow the artwork to move in for the opening in 2025, spring of 2025. And then as we move into this phase and uh, talk through different funding sources and things uh, as they evolve, phases two and three, there's no set timeline for those right now, if that was what you were 
kind of thinking about for a long time. Any other questions or things people are curious about? The question was, how does the fire escape work? Uh, I will do my best to explain it. Okay, so one of the reasons the non-historic existing fire escape is being removed is because it would collide with the location for the elevator. So we, we had to redo it regardless. So the fire escape services only the third floor because the third floor has only one staircase. The main stair extends up to the third floor. There's a second back stair that goes from the lowest level up to the second floor, but it stops there. And you have to have two ways out of any public space. So that we were required to have the second means of egress from the top level, hence the fire escape. So we're, you'll exit out that arched opening and then it's a switchback stair. It goes down the landing, turns around, goes back to the landing, turns around again, and eventually lands on that outdoor deck. Is that, is that an adequate explanation? Yeah, yeah, you'll, I mean, in, in an emergency, you, you will come down and loop around that, that staircase to get out of the third floor, but it's not connected to the first or second stories because we have that we have that secondary existing internal stair that we're using as means of egress from the first and second floor and the uh, lower level. Um. The question is about storage of art. Will, will there be a storage facility for art at the Wire Hall? And I mean, the, the simple answer is no, that we're not building a storage facility. Um, for that building, we will keep our storage facility here. But the not so simple answer, um, the more complicated answer is that we're thinking about the walls of the building itself, these galleries, which will be hung salon style in you know, many ways will be kind of like an open storage that will relieve pressure on our storage facility here by having the collection itself on view. So um, I, I would say that my first thought about this building is, aha, uh -huh, we'll turn it into a big storage facility. And then I thought, you know, that would be, you know, awfully disappointing. And so this idea of the building and how it would have originally been hung with art, um, you know, sort of grew into this vision of, exploring a great mansion of the Gilded Age that would have been hung or to ceiling with art. And so in a way, you know, every wall becomes art storage. Also, the top floor of the building, um, which we're calling, you know, our study center for prints, drawings, and photographs, will have um, flat files around the periphery of that level of the building where the roof line slopes down. And you know that will that will actually be a storage center for works on paper, um, you know where you know we can make our our drawings and photographs accessible to scholars, curators, 
um, you know, in, in that kind of an environment. Similar, um, some of you may know, um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, there's a Prince, Prince Drawings and Photographs Study Center in the Perlman Building, and that's been, you know, something of a model for us that will copy certain aspects of. So. Um, and yes, so um, I, I will repeat the question. The question was about the the gallery for jewelry, and we are actually designing cases that will have drawers underneath so that the jewelry collection um, can be stored in the very same gallery where it will be shown, and a docent or a museum staff member can open up, say, a drawer of, you know, bullets, food course, jewelry and, and show it to people. So yes, yeah, so there will be a couple of specific instances there where you know, the idea of storage is built into the gallery. Um, for those who are watching on Zoom, you know, we're in Woodmere's Coca del Bueno Gallery, which has, you know, four, gi six gigantic skylights, and we are hearing torrents of rain for our heads. Um, any further questions? I think with that, um, I'm glad to, I'm sure Jeff is glad to, Darren, Megan, Justin, other members of your staff are glad to, the wonderful Bill Lutz, who is our security wizard, um, is designing the security system for the wireless is, is here and thank you, Bill. And, and Scott Swire, who is um, our food services consultant is here and you know any of us are glad to answer any of the questions that we might have. And Standish is here. If you have any ideas about people who'd like to name a gallery, answer your person. Anyway, with that, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you to everybody who's on Zoom. Thank you for, you know, braving this horrendous storm to be here. And um, we're incredibly excited. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill.